Closo Pau. Happy Diwali, welcome one and all. It's Trustees Week when we celebrate the hours of voluntary work that board members give. And importantly, we ask those challenging questions around how we can do it better. My name is Kate Carr and I'll be chairing today's event and I'll tell you a bit more about the event in a moment. But first, just a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces for you. So as usual, please keep your microphones on mute. We are recording the event for people who aren't able to attend and we save the chat bar to gather feedback and good ideas from you all. And we love it when the chat bar is lively. So please do make good use of it to ask questions and to enrich the discussion with panel members. Uh, if this isn't an option for you, please raise the hand button or let us know in any way that works for you. Today's topic has got the potential to touch on all our personal experiences and hopefully we can co-create that space together to explore the subject. And I know that we'll be supportive of each other uh, and consider our language and be willing to educate ourselves as well as learn from others as we go. We are co-hosted by the Good Practice Exchange team. Uh, so give a big wave to Sean and to Sam, say hello, uh, and by the new community of practice for board members, a cross-sector peer support group sharing what works and as often what doesn't work. Some members have been supporting each other in action learning sets and we aim to get together for events like this from time to time uh, and we'll pop a link into the chat bar for anybody who wants to sign up. Equality, diversity and inclusion has been present in almost every conversation that members have had so far and it's no wonder. A report on the housing sector in 2019 shows the scale of the challenge. For example, with young people making up 21% of social tenants and 16% of the population under 34, just one to 2% of board members were under the age of 34. Women still remain underrepresented. In fact, in 2019, things had slipped back a little. And there was underrepresentation from people from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. People with a disability were underrepresented. And of board members asked, around 9% preferred not to provide information on sexual orientation. First Minister Mark Drakeford spoke, spoke recently at the launch of the CLAW Social Leadership Programme and said we must do three things in relation to leadership. Diversification, distribu distribution and democratisation. We must tap into every bit of talent that we have here in Wales. We must distribute decision making and we must bring it closer to the people that we are here to serve. And he said it much better than that. With all of this in mind, we are really grateful to you all for joining us today for an exploration of how boards understand equality. And so to our panel. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Joe Stockley. Joe runs communications at Diverse Cymru. He's a trustee with the Wales Council for Voluntary Action. He cares about volunteering and getting young people involved in decision making. And he tells me he cares a lot about good food. Joe works with the Young Trustee Movement to increase diversity of the board, um, of boards as the South Wales ambassador for the movement. And Joe is in a lot of demand today with it being Trustees Week, so he has to leave us at around half past 12. So Joe, uh, I mentioned earlier that we've got so few young people involved in boards. Um, what are we missing out on and what can we do? Okay, uh, that's a massive question and I could talk for a long time about that and I promise I won't because um, I think, yeah, there's, there's a point about um, listening. Yeah, so firstly, we're missing out on just uh, a huge range of talent, of expertise, of passion, of drive and of uh, experience, um, lived experience often. Um, you see situations with boards that work with young people and for young people with no young people on the board or no young people speaking into the board. Um, and I think that, that can be a travesty. Um, I think uh, young people, in, in terms of engaging young people, you gain such a vast skill set and you also gain uh, passion. Um, I think there's something to be said. Uh, I know um, every time you talk about a 
developing boards, you talk about board dynamics and, and board well-being and board, board sort of health. I think there's something that really, really comes with um, guiding people through an experience. Um, and I think young people in that situation, I think we, we're more, we can be more adaptable in some circumstances. And I think that can really benefit a board dynamic because young people are going to be there to ask those questions that I guarantee you 90% of the board want to ask again or ask as well. And um, yeah, poke, poke questions at, at things that at, at sort of short sentences, maybe from the director of finance that you go, hang on, what, what does that actually mean? <laughs> Let's just break down that particular line of the balance sheet and talk about that in slightly more detail. Um, the second point of that question is what, what can we do? Um, I identified sort of three or four um, top points. I'm just going to re really quickly run through them. Uh, I, I know we're short for time. Um, paying expenses for, for young trustees um, and be uh, forward, like pushing with that. And that's not just for young trustees, that's for all trustees, um, obviously, because uh, I know my first trustee position with the British Youth Council, for example, if I weren't, if, if they didn't pay for my train ticket to London, I, it would have been that or groceries. Like they're, 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 they're important, um, really, really important for, for in, engaging young people. Um, secondly, accepting requests for volunteering leave. If you work in an organization, if, you, if you're senior in a charity, um, at the very least allowing staff to flex working hours. I'm here because I'm taking annual leave to be here. Like being part of uh, events, trustee events are generally in midday or like at times when, I'm working. I'm not senior in my organization. I can't just take an hour out or two hours out to, to attend events like this. Um, and, th and thirdly, being prepared to flex. Mm -hmm. um, we, we welcome applications from young people. And I mean, you can put in any protected characteristic there. That's not job done. Um, that is the very first step I think you can take. If you want to engage young people, consider the times of your meetings. Um, and yeah, thank God for Zoom. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're all really grateful for, for a pandemic learning that, that it does. turns out we don't actually need to travel two hours to, to the one hour meeting uh, all of the time. So, yeah, paying expenses, um, being prepared to flex and, and volunteering leave are three things I would identify of sort of engaging young trustees more appropriately. Joe, some fantastic points in there. Um, for the purposes of um, pe some people who um, are unable to see the screen, I'll, I will uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, Kate, uh, I'm chairing today's event. Um, Joe, you picked up uh, so many wonderful points that we will need to come back to throughout the next hour. I'm particularly um, interested in that idea of um, asking those questions um, uh, so we will come back to those as, as we go through. But you were talking a lot there about tapping into talent. Uh, and I'd like to introduce everybody next to the wonderful Joyce Ningini. Joyce has extensive experience with the third sector, supporting and empowering refugee and asylum seekers from around the world. She is a strong advocate for human rights. Uh, and Joyce is the mentoring project manager for Equal Power, Equal Voice, a partnership led by the Women's Equality Network for Wales uh, in partnership with East Disability Wales and Stonewall Company. And that is aimed at promoting equal representation in public life and politics. Um, Joyce, according to a uh, Welsh Government report in 2016, um, there were four things uh, that were particularly identified as barriers for women. And that was around lack of confidence, lack of role models, insufficient training and mentoring provision and a lack of a centralised place to find information on public life. And we've seen a number of organisations working really hard to address barriers of confidence and we're seeing mentoring schemes improving all the time. Do you think it is working and what more do we need to do? Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. It's a real honour to be here. Um, yeah, I think a mentor, the mentoring schemes that are in place now are doing um, an incredible job to... Um, to tackle some of these um, barriers that, that we're being faced with. Um, I am lucky to be um, working with an incredible team on with the um, Equal Power, Equal Voice um, Mentoring Project, which is meant to start um, um, with a launch in December the 9th. Um, this um, um, mentoring project has come off um, has um, 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 been um, has has come off um, amazing schemes as well from Wen Wheels, um, 
which I have been previous, which I have been um, lucky to be a part of. Um, the WEN mentoring scheme of um, 2020 um, was, was a real, um, I don't know, it, it did so much to um, all the participants who were, who, who took part in it. Um, the data, according to the data collected from this scheme, 82% um, of the participants who took part on the scheme um, felt that they understood the process of running for appointment to a local or national board. And um, 75%, um, there was a 75% increase as well in the number of participants who um, felt that they understood um, the roles and responsibilities of um, a board and public bodies. There was also a 46% increase in the participants who felt um, that they were more confident in being a lead speaker at a panel or a conference. Um, this, I am, um, as a, a matter of fact, a beneficiary of this um, mentoring scheme, which took place in 2020. And I believe it's um, thanks to that scheme that I am here today. Um, I have also worked with um, um, asylum seeking and refugee women, supporting them to um, build confidence and, and skills to be able to, um, to fit into the society, to be able to contribute to the society. And so I, I know what, how important these schemes can be how important mentoring is and what impact it, it creates on lives, what impact it has on lives. Um, helping women in particular and women from the, particularly women from the um, marginalized backgrounds to come forth and um, feel confident enough to um, take part in, in public life. And um, in respect to your question of whether enough is being done to um, tackle these barriers, I, I believe um, there's still so much to be done. Um, it is important, I would say, for um, boards to, when they are employing or when they're recruiting people to work, to, to take on roles for, this board, um, for, for their um, boards, it is important to consider that there's a variety of um, talent from marginalized communities that are not being tapped into. Um, like um, Joe was saying, there's so much untapped talent out there from these backgrounds. Um, and um, I think employers should, should be more, um, um, they should be more flexible in em when, they, when they're employing or recruiting people to work. Um, on, on these boards. And I also believe that it is important to work collaboratively with um, organizations, grassroots organizations that are working or who have, um, are working frontline with um, these people, with people from marginalized um, communities, because there's so much, like I said, there's so much I have worked with um, women who um, have come to this country with so much experience with um, vast experience, um, lived experience as well that they've got that can really contribute to um, a, a much better and developed um, society. And I believe that we could be tapping into, we could be, um, we'll, we'll gain a lot more and build a much um, stronger society um, by tapping into those talents. And so collaborative working with all these organizations in helping the, by helping them to, I don't know, maybe um, build skills as well, um, creating more awareness on the need for people to take on roles, to come into, um, to be able to pick up um, or, or tap into the opportunities that are being offered as well is really vital. And um, yes, just working together, working together with people from these communities will go a long way to create a more diverse um, 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 representation in public life and, and politics as well, I would say. 
Wonderful. And what a great example of collaboration there with some really motivating messages around um, how it how it can make a difference. And you through the organizations that you partner in with, you know, really are creating um, that next wave uh, um, of, of talent helping to make um, board membership more accessible. And so the challenge is for everybody, isn't it, to respond to that and to um, uh, and to make sure those, um, you know, that that talent is 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 uh, is um, drawn on. Uh, so thank you. That was great. Um, and so to Anne Collis, Anne has uh, what is sometimes called a portfolio career. Uh, the common thread for Anne has been a drive for social justice, in particular developing new thinking about wicked social problems and reframing, reframing complex and complicated information, easy for you to say, to make it available to wider audiences. So she was co-founder of Barod Community Interest Company, recently leaving so that she could complete her PhD, congratulations Anne, uh, about public involvement in policymaking. Anne herself is neurodivergent and for five years was a wheelchair user. She's been a board member of third sector organizations and has written and provided advice on how to recruit for and how to run inclusive board meetings. She was a WEN mentee in 2020 and has recently published her thesis, Not the Usual Suspects. So Anne, with all of this experience, why are you not on a public board? <laughs> well, First of all, like Joyce, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Women's Equality Network mentoring scheme last year. Going back to the report that you mentioned, Kate, the 2016 Welsh Government one, those four sets of barriers, I think, really are starting to be addressed. The WEN scheme certainly gave me the confidence, the role models, the training, the mentoring, it showed me that there is now a centralized place to get information about public life and there's support to apply for boards. And that comes to a great big but, because in my case, doing the mentoring had an unintended consequence, which is why I'm not actually on a public board. And unless things change, I don't intend to be applying for those positions either. You see, what the scheme gave me was the ability to apply, but also the confidence to go, I'm not willing to present myself inauthentically just to get myself onto a board. I did try applying for some. I tried being inauthentic to give what was needed, and it just made me hate myself. Now, there's always the exception. So lots of people tagged me on Twitter. So I did apply to be on the advisory panel for the Centre for Digital Public Services. And I did it in a spirit of, this is me, take it or leave it. And really to their credit, they did accept me onto the advisory panel. I didn't apply for the board, but forever to their credit that they accepted me to the panel but in my experience that's the exception not standard practice so in my doctoral thesis one of the things that I looked at is what what is actually going on with boards what is going on with diversity and there's the easiest way to explain it is it's like group think so boards tend to have a way of thinking and new members, however diverse they are, either have to already have that way of thinking about the world, or they have to learn to adopt that way of thinking, or you meet your other people who've been on a board and have spent all the time feeling marginalized and have just given up. So what you can end up with now, with all the fantastic mentoring, all the amazing opportunities, all the enthusiasm for increasing diversity is a board that increasingly does have diversity of experience of the individuals on it, 
but any diversity of perspective or diversity in how you make sense of problems is still being squashed in favor of this group think, this traditional way of thinking. So academically, and also it's been shown in some more practical reports around boards, it's the diversity of sense making not simply the diversity of personal characteristics that is associated with the ability to solve complex and long-standing problems. So for me, I think life's too short for me to spend time feeling marginalized and giving up. So I'd rather not be on a board, I'd rather stay on the outside for the time being, which also gives me a bit more freedom to say the things I've just said without it offending anybody um, because I'm not on their board. So please, in today and in the future, just don't. There is no sense in increasing a superficial diversity of boards while you're squashing the value and the ability to think differently, and to use everything that you have uh, in that board position. Wow, that was really powerful, Anne. I get so many mixed emotions on a personal level. Um, so thank you for sharing that story. Um, I feel uh, that was obviously an organization with the advisory panel well able to spot talent. Um, uh, I think we need to come back to, for a wider discussion on, on um, group think later in the conversation. Um, uh, you get some really interesting comments on the chat bar there as well. Keep those coming, please, everybody. Um, but we will move on to um, our final panel member, uh, Claire Flood Page. So Claire is a performance auditor with Audit Wales. Um, she's been involved in the development of Audit Wales Equality and Diversity Strategy and guidance on understanding what the 2010 Equality Act means for audit work. Uh, her interest in and her work on equalities has been inspired by her experience of working in a profession which is becoming more diverse. Claire is also inspired um, by her experience of being a mother to three daughters. Um, she and her colleague Pip Fido are currently working on a review of equality impact assessment processes uh, across the public sector in Wales. Um, Claire, can you tell us a little bit about why this work is important and what difference you hope it will make? Thank you very much. Yes, um, it's, I'm, I'm, I, I, was thinking about why this is really important for boards as well but I think a lot of the issues for public bodies will probably have some resonance here. Uh, in Audit Wales we're currently doing some work about really how public bodies take account of the impact of their decisions on the most vulnerable and um, for us that means looking at the equalities impact assessment process um, because that's their kind of formalised way of doing this. Um, equalities impact assessment is sort of, I think it's really quite important. It's a way of contributing towards a sort of goal of equal Wales. Um, and very fundamentally, it's really a, a big part of just good decision making and good policy making um, done well. You know, those assessments, I think they reduce the impact um, of kind of unintended consequences coming from um, decision making. And I think they can help that challenge that kind of group think idea that Anne was talking about a little bit there, because they kind of give a systematic way of considering, you know, the impact of decisions on um, different groups of people. Now, obviously, um, as you'll be aware, most of, very often they're combined with other uh, legislative requirements. So quite often the equalities impact assessment process will be done alongside uh, looking at the, you know, how policies feed into the wellbeing goals um, and other you know, the Welsh language um, goals as well and, and, and various other uh, issues. And um, I think it's just quite important that these kind of all have their own appropriate weights. Um, and, and done well, that can really make make decisions better. Um, I think we're very clear that 
equalities impact assessment is a process it's not a tick box at the end um and which is really what happens when it's done very badly and uh we, you know that that that's you know really just rubber stamping decisions that have already been made so that that's not great and our work looks at it across the public sector we want to look at good practice um, and we want to support learning one of the big things that we're looking at is how public bodies are kind of understanding and the newish their, their newest duty so that would be the socioeconomic duty um, which uh, which which is quite new and a little bit different and um, importantly how how boards and uh, well boards in this case and and public bodies really can widen their thinking to take account of the cumulative impact of decisions on groups of people so and in that way we really are beginning to when when, when that happens i think people are really beginning to improve decision making and um, so so that's what we're doing uh, and what we're looking at at the moment so thank you claire that was that was really helpful uh, so Anne said um, there is a little point in um, increasing diversity if we, while we are squashing the ability to think differently and made this point around group think, which I think has resonated with a lot of people. So I'd just like to go back to the panel um, to, to ask the question, you know, can boards uh, understand equality if they are not diverse? And how meaningful can scrutiny of impact assessments be? And while we go back around the panel for their views on that, I would just invite people to put questions or um, points that they would like to have discussed into the chat bar while we hear this next set of answers. So, um, uh, Joe, can I come to you first? How, how can boards understand equality if they're not diverse and how meaningful can scrutiny of impact assessments be? Um, <laughs> firstly, um, I don't think, I think uh, systems made by individuals suit the system, suits the individuals that, who made the system. Um, that, that is to say, I think if a, if a trustee board or a board more generally doesn't reflect the people it serves, it won't reflect the people it serves in the decisions it takes. Um, I get... Um, I think it can be quite frustrating sometimes. Um, obviously, f first <laughs> elephant in the room, cis, straight, white male, like talking on this point, I fully appreciate the, um, the context there. Um, and I think there's a point uh, on um, reflecting the diversity of the community you serve, um, but also there's a point on real meaningful engagement and what that looks like. Um, I think everyone is has been fed up of uh, any young people I talk to, for example, are absolutely fed up of being the rubber stamp. Um, and I think that can that can come in in sort of um, equality impact assessments. It can come in in organisational surveys. It can come in in anything. Um, you, you very quickly learn when you're being sort of tagged as uh, a young person who re responds to their emails um, and is happy to fill in surveys for free and is happy to provide the little tick box to their event that says, oh, well, wonderful, you're engaging young people really, really effectively there. Um, whereas actually that's that's the... the that's not even the starting line that's that's lower in the in the sort of if that i know there's a ladder of youth participation of seven rungs and that is probably below ground it's dug into the ground that 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 stage of, of youth involvement um 100 and um that is is it becomes you, you talk to other young people who get involved in in things like this and um you learn very quickly when you're being uh, when you're being invited to the table, but you're actually not at the table. You're at the little people's table at, at the bottom, um, and and they they pass down the kids' meal to you. And it's 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 beyond frustrating because it it, it denigrates your experience. And and just to say, if you're a, there is no such thing as a young trustee. We're talking about young trustees as if it's its own legal entity. There is no such thing. There is a trustee or there is not a trustee. Um, if you're engaging young people on your board, you're engaging them as a full trustee with the responsibilities and the experience. They're on that board because they are they have the expertise and they have the experience to be there, not because they're being patted on the head for, for being young people. And I think that that goes two ways. You've got to then engage young people as you would engage anyone else with fair challenge, with appropriate challenge, with with uh, criticism, but in, in a like constructive way. Um, yeah, sorry, I've, I've got off on the on the first point and not really engaged on the second point. Um, 
I'm afraid I've got to leave now. I'm really, yeah. really sorry. Uh, I'll just drop some information for me in the chat um, if you want to drop me a further line or, or a tweet or anything like that. Joe, you've got rounds of applause for that. So uh, thank you very much. I can see people applauding on the screen. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's been great to have you here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to um, bring the same question to you next, but I'm going to be slightly cheeky uh, and widen it a little. Um, Chris Bolton, who many of you will um, know um, from Audit Wells and uh, Good Practice Exchange team. Um, Chris asks, do you have a view on how regulatory bodies and others who have a role in judging the effectiveness of boards might have a role in changing this? Um, obviously, if Chris wants to jump in there as well, please, please do. Could, could I just expand on that a bit for you, Anne? And, and perhaps for everyone else, is that um, loads of what board, I mean, and this is from my, I, I'm not just from Wales, I have another life outside Wales or the office, so I'm involved in Merthyr Valley's homes. Um, and, and other places and lots of what boards get involved in is about the money and resources and, and that kind of drives I think a certain type of, of this behaviour and it was really a back to Anne is where do you think that the regulatory bodies and people like the Charity Commission have a role in this if you like shaping some of that group think? Okay so first of all the regulatory bodies are possibly in exactly the same position as the boards in terms of groupthink. So the first challenge would be for the regulatory bodies themselves to change how they see things. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to think how they would be able to evaluate whether there was meaningful inclusivity. Um, if I was talking about co-design or co-production, one of the key things that I look for is whether anybody on the board is equally welcome to initiate something because the one area that tends to be most obvious is that some people are expected to take the lead and set the frame. Some people are listened to more, whereas others are expected to respond within the framing that others have, others have given them. So in very practical ways, um, I, as Kate said, I was one of the co-founders of a Barrod Community Interest Company. And one of my fellow co-founders who tragically died in February, um, an amazing man called Alan Armstrong, he designed a way to check this, which basically involved throwing a ball of wool around so that the next person who spoke had to catch the ball of wool. And you very quickly got to see how the dynamics were working within a meeting of who got to speak at which point. Now, obviously most public service boards are not going to be up for playing games like that. Um, there are some more scientific methods for looking at the interactions within a board, but I'm really not sure that that, I'm really not sure that that would solve the issue. Uh, there aren't, e and maybe this is the problem. Regulatory bodies love things that you can count. And I can't remember where I stole the phrase from or uh, whether I came up with it myself. I really doubt that. But basically, if you can count it, it's probably not that important because the things that are really important are the things where you need to tell stories. And that's to do with the idea that everything is far too, if everything is complex rather than a nice linear system, you do need to tell stories. So I guess having waffled the end point to Chris's is the boards, is that regulatory services need to ask for stories from people about how, about what their experience is. Sorry, I had to waffle to get there. I heard you uh, working your way through quite a complex issue there actually, and reaching a really powerful conclusion about people's experience. 
um, and journey. So thank you for that, Anne. Um, and oh, wait, well, all that I can say is thank you to the people who were popping stuff in the chat bar because that was helping me to go, yeah, actually, you know yourself whether it, what kind of engagement you've had. Just listen to the stories. And just to pick out one or two of these before we come to Joyce, um, uh, Mary Ann Brocklesby, um, totally agreeing with you. Um, looking at the number of facets, uh, sense making within the board, between the board and the staff of the organisation, between different board members and the community, people they serve, uh, and asking in what way do panel members think sense making can be more inclusive? Um, uh, and I'll pick up some of the other points in a moment, but I just want to give Joyce an opportunity just to uh, um, uh, briefly address that issue of uh, how can boards understand and scrutinise things like uh, equality impact assessments um, if, uh, if, if they aren't diverse. Um, I, I think it's, it's quite difficult. It is almost impossible to to understand um, equality or to understand for bots to understand how to be how to to how equality works or diversity if they don't engage with um, diverse um, communities if they don't bring them on board to um, to find out what it is to work with people from different communities. It is really important. And I'll go back to what I said about working collaboratively. It's, to me, it's just um, um, involving everyone. It's bringing everyone on board. It's keeping everyone in, 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 in involved and, and informed about whatever they are doing is, um, and making people feel like they are a part of um, the society, making people feel like they are a part of the community. And that is the only way that um, they can achieve um, equality or, or diversity in, and, and bringing on board um, um, or, or picking up on what Anne said before about um, people's stories and people's experiences. That is really crucial as well. It is important to um, listen to people, to, to find out what they've experienced, what, they, what they've been through, and all those stories are equally very important to, and, and they would obviously um, keep, keep the board informed on how to create a more diverse and equal board. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I, that links quite a lot, actually, to what, um, uh, what's coming up in the chat bar as well, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the panel on in a moment. But just before I do, I just would like to ask everybody here to start to think um, around the kind of action that they uh, that you might take or that we might take in our role as board members um, is one question. What action might you take in your role as a board member? Um, and what would you tell somebody um, who wasn't here today, what would you tell them about this um, conversation? Uh, and if um, you can sort of start to pop those into the chat bar as well, that would be really great. So um, we have uh, Adele Morgan um, surprised that co-production is talked about a lot, yet not many have been trained in it. I think that relates very much to what Joyce has been talking about um, and to, um, uh, what Anne has also been saying. So the training and co-production being important links back to the comment that Mary Anne was making as well. Uh, and quite a controversial comment as well around what tips can the panel give me to help challenge a culture that thinks if we change the way we recruit trustees, then we increase the risk to the risk to the organization of weaker governance. Um, and the person offering that up says, I don't believe this is true, but would welcome practical advice on how to win over other people. Is that something that isn't said very often? Um, that perception? I, I, uh, I think any one of us would want to challenge that. I mean, the whole conversation today is around the fact that we are missing out on so much talent um, and the ability to bring new, innovative, experienced, insightful thinking to the table. But I would just like to put um, that point 
to the panel, please. Um, so I'm going to go back round again. So Joyce, sometimes there's a perception apparently that we weaken the governance of an organisation uh, if we change the way that we recruit trustees. Um, what practical advice? I think you've touched on some of this already, but maybe it's just worth going back over some of those tips around how we can um, tap into that talent. Um, uh, maybe it's board members ourselves. But let's reframe that as to what can we do as individual board members, do you think, to um, uh, in, encourage uh, equality, inclusion and diversity within our own boards? Um, I'll, I'll talk again. I'll go back to, um, to, 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 to collaborative working. I, I think as a community and as a society, um, we should be working together, um, which we are doing in, in, in a, a greater sense at the moment, working together with all, um, communities, with all, um, 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 um different the different um, um, communities who are involved in this um, we should be working directly with grassroots um, organizations i think um, there is a lot of talent there there's um, so much going on there are people who could be bringing so much on board who are not um, being given the opportunities or who do not even know that there are opportunities out there that they could um, um, that they, they, they could um, 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 get a grasp of, or they do not even know that there's these conversations going on. So it's about creating awareness. It's about working hand in hand with um, people from different backgrounds. I'll just um, keep saying the same thing. It's, it's to me, that is, that is what should be happening. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think we'll, if we, if we do that, we'll, will go a long way to um, bring more talent, um, diverse talent on board. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I can see um, uh, Catherine, um, who's Chief Executive of Women's Quality Network, has raised her hand. Um, uh, so I'll come to you in a minute if that's OK. But prior to that, uh, Chris Bolton putting you on notice here. Mary Ann Brocklesby wants to know if anyone has, exper has experimented with significant change sense making, which does storytelling combined with participatory impact assessment to capture diverse thinking and perceptions. And I don't know why, but I feel you may be a good person to uh, maybe offer up some thoughts around that. And I'm sure Anne will want to come in on that one as well. Do you want me now to say yes, something? Yes, would be lovely. I, I, I probably the, the best thing I can point on to is measuring the mountain. So the, the work that um, was done with uh, South University of South Wales, where they did some work around the impact of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, and they gathered lots of narrative in that space. But that could have a chat again about that. But if, if there's a website, and who is it? Um, Interlink RCT were involved in it as well. So that there was a bit of work in that space. I don't know if that answers Anne's, Mary Ann's question. Does that answer for you, Mary Ann? Um, yeah, that, I think that's one, um, one possibility. I, I think um, I, I work internationally in Africa and Asia on participatory uh, assessments, which is about ensuring that marginalised voices can make contributions and change in policy making and Anne is perfectly right it's about redefining the space in which conversations are held and one of the things that boards I think can support is thinking about how you hold those conversations within the board and how you make space for a different way of talking about an issue which still um, meets regulatory requirements but starts pushing the envelope for example if you're starting to think strategically about the type of change you want your organization to see you are thinking also what is the kind of significant changes that our communities want to see that's our baseline let's ask them and let's see where there are differences and see where there are communalities and see where we can move forward. 
often we start uh, from stories taken from above rather than stories taken from below to start to devise our strategic vision, which is uh, what boards have to do. Okay. We can start from below and that makes a difference. And we start from thinking from the change that others want to see. And those others became the central part of our vision. can see Chris nodding vigorously there, uh, along with many other people as well. I think you've touched on um, uh, some powerful points there. So thank you very much for that. I just, before coming to Catherine, I just want to pick up on a comment um, from Andrea Gordon. Andrea says, there are also some very practical barriers to the inclusion of disabled people. Does the board meet in an accessible venue? And that doesn't just mean parking, it means on a bus route. For me as a totally blind person, this would be essential. Otherwise I'd need to get a taxi there independently. Also provision of accessible information in everyday language. I won't join a board unless it has a commitment to that. So there is no point. Um, I'm gonna ask Catherine to come in briefly now, if that's okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kate and um, Jock and Val for organising this really interesting event. Um, I had uh, a couple of points I wanted to make slash questions. And one of them is around, um, I think, certainly where, where I feel charity boards, like when Wales's board, can be a really great stepping stone for people, stepping up, up then to the next level, which is public boards. And public boards obviously have the benefit of, of being paid. So I feel like us as a charity sector need to be better at developing board shadowing opportunities. For example, our, our constitution at WEN says 10 trustees, but that doesn't mean we can't co-op people and then um, have kind of a shadowing um, kind of system where we, we bring in first time trustees. And in my experience, we've got uh, two first time trustees on our board at the moment, one of whom happens to be a young person and it is amazing because they bring a different perspective. And I think what public boards need to do, reflecting back Anne's point so eloquently made, is not think that you've had to have been on a board before, because I think there's there's experience in the room. So if you've been asked, do you can you manage budgets? You know, have you got experience of overseeing budgets? Well, every Every woman I know, for example, has experience of managing their own budget and working out what they can spend on the kids' school uniform, if they have kids working out what they can spend on food, etc. You know, these, these things, that is experience and public boards need to take that into account also. So, um, yeah, I think they need to open their mind. It's not, it doesn't matter. You've got to start somewhere and you can bring brilliant experience if you've never been on a board before, if you've got a questioning mind and from your own lived experience. So I feel like boards need to really, public boards especially, need to really open their minds to that. Thank you. Sorry, it's not a question. It's just a comment. Thank you, Catherine. But I think panel members can hopefully pick up on some of that. I'd like to come back to Claire, if that's OK. Um, Claire, we've heard a lot uh, today around um, the need for meaningful involvement and engagement. How, how much um, can this work look at how equality impact assessments are informed from the outset? Yes, um, that's, that is something that we do want to be coming up shortly to ask about because there is a require in public bodies will very often ask for some kind of input to inform this you know they don't but what we really want to find out is does that really feel meaningful is it too late do people get asked questions which they don't really see the point in responding to because it's window dressing or the decision has been made all that kind of thing and I think that that's something that we're going to be um, asking uh, probably some of the people involved in this discussion um, about in the next few weeks, because it, you know, and, and I think that does come back to, and us as regulators being a bit more open to understanding stories and people's lived experience of uh, participating in these kinds of, um, ex, you know, in our own audit and regulatory work. So, um, but yeah, because I think quite, my impression is that quite often people may feel that this is 
you know, uh, a done deal and they're asked to contribute far too late in the process when it, when the decisions are made and that people aren't really listening. And, um, and I think that's something that we want to really understand is how, how public bodies can really take account of the experience of other people and what um, other people can bring to their decision making process. Um, uh, thank you Claire. thank you very much Chris I'm just wondering you I could just see you've commented there around the um uh, some of that experience do you just want to talk to that a little bit more in relation to this as well no oh, thanks can I talk about something else yes of course no Would sorry I, I will talk about <laughs> can I can I, I just drop something in and it's it's about the bit about um that weakening of governance that I I I, I get I get I, I hear that a lot and there's some stuff about, you know, what is governance there, there for? And, and there's some conversations I've been having with some other people about what the difference between accountability and responsibility and a bit about some governance frameworks are all about providing this accountability that others can judge you about, like the money and the other things. But the actual point about if we move from accountability to responsibility, that I think fits better with this idea of actually if our board is diverse, and represents the people who we're actually serving. We have responsibility built in. And there's a bit of a kind of weird thing about you need independence on your board and experience on that. But actually, if you've got people who are really representative of what you're doing, you've got responsibility built in because they've got skin in the game. And I, I use the example from mm. where I'm on the board of Merthyr Valley's Homes and Audit Committee. Mm. I've got two members of democratic body who sit next to me. So they're mm. one of them's from the staff, one's a tenant who lives in the house. And we're discussing the, basically the finances of the organization. And it's, there's a bit of stuff going on in, in my head. I mean, how are these people independent? Well, they're not, but they are very representative of what goes on from a staff perspective and a tenant perspective. And that, mm. that, they, they are they are they have sort of bit that they are they are not independent and it really matters to them builds in that responsibility so i think we get better governance and better quality call it uh, better accountability because they've got skin in the game and if we get our financial decisions wrong the one person potentially loses the jo their job and the other one's house is at risk and i think that bit about actually the weakening of governance is not an argument we should put up with because actually it's a strengthening of governance Sorry, when that's the end of my TED talk, thank you. I am applauding you, as I'm sure many other people are, um, uh, Chris. Do you, I, do, do you get, I just wonder whether yourself and panel members as well sometimes get that sense that the organisations that are sometimes um, struggling um, with the issue are, are ones that maybe are not working with communities that closely in the first place, so they're only reaching out at the point that, there is a, a need to plug a gap. Um, I just wonder um, what your view of that would be, Anne. I've got to confess, you need to repeat the question because half of me was reading the chat box. <laughs> well, it, it, is, it is beautifully distracting, isn't it? It is lively and there's lots of great stuff. Tell me what's caught you. Was there anything specific that caught your eye there? that you would want to come to? If not, I will go back to the, the question for uh, you. The, the, the one that I was thinking yeah. about how to respond carefully yeah. was around the idea of shadow trustees and shadow board members, just because there are a few little, there have been a few little legal um, issues in the past about the status of shadowing. Mm. So that was what I was trying to think carefully how to construct well, if you want a little answer. bit longer to think about that, um, no, it's all right. I popped, I, I, I popped it in the chat box right. just as you said. And let's ask Anne. So I'd only half been listening. Sorry. And the bit that we were just sort of picking up. Um, so Chris was was talking about that um, issue of working, um, uh, you know, working in this way strengthens, um, shifts mm -hmm. things towards responsibility and strengthens governance. Yep. And I was just posing the question: um, Do you, do we sometimes find that the organisations that maybe struggling to work in this way are the ones that perhaps aren't working with communities in an ongoing way so they're reaching out at a point that they they need to plug a gap i think that's definitely part of it i think also sometimes in wales we forget our rich heritage of mutual aid 
and slip into some of the uh, philanthropy thinking of let us it, it's no it's no um coincidence that in England in the 19th century there was a huge rise in charities and in Wales in the 19th century there was a huge rise in mutual aid organizations and I think one of the challenges that we have with board thinking is sometimes it taps in a bit more into the philanthropy thinking of we will have the great and the good who will do good for our beneficiaries rather than let us all work together as a community, all bringing different types of knowledge, different skill sets, different experience, but all equal and interlinked and all trying to work for the same aim. And look at the strength that you're creating with that one gesture as and well. I do apologise, uh, Andrea. Yeah, the bit that you won't have seen. I'm a very talk with my hands yeah. person. So, yes, it was interlocking my hands to show how we're all together. Whereas with the charity boards, I was putting my hands up above my head for the boards and that they're then relating to the people down below. And I put my Thank hands you. below my chin. Thanks for that description. I just want to briefly um, come back to uh, Joyce, uh, who was telling us about the uh, Equal Power, Equal Voice mentoring scheme, which is absolutely um, about trying to make sure that we get equal representation on boards. And Joyce, I'd really just like to um, um, ask you what your um, greatest hopes and maybe some of your anxieties are as you take this cohort through this wonderful experience put on by this range of diverse organizations for the people that experience that and come out the other end of it what are your hopes for them and what are your anxieties and that's for joyce do you want me to repeat the question I'm not sure she can hear me. Joyce, if you can hear me, can you just nod? I think she may have frozen. Um, Mary Ann, I know that you've been closely involved in the scheme. So if it's OK, slightly cheeky of me, but I am just going to put that question to you for equal power, Thank equal you, voice. Um, um, what, what would be your hopes and anxieties? Yes. Um. Hang on a sec. We might, can I just check? Have I we got Joyce back? Joyce is back, I think. Great. Joyce, are you with us? No, I think that screen's definitely frozen. If you could briefly pick that up in about a minute for me, Mary Ann, that would be really helpful. Thank you. I think my hopes are is this is so exciting to have such a range of different voices being brought in and in a point where because we've experimented with hybrid and online mentoring and the whole program there is an opportunity to be more inclusive and differently inclusive because of that um, and I notice we haven't spoken of how hybrid and online helps change diversity within boards or doesn't um, so that that's one of my hopes um, one of my anxieties is that public life will not be ready for a cohort of a hundred passionate, supported, strong um, women, men and differently gendered people who are ready to make change, already have been making change and have developed the skills to, to have greater impact. And I think we have to rise to meet them. I think that is a wonderful rallying call on which to draw things to a close, to thank the Good Practice Exchange team for uh, co coordinating, organising, hosting and, and, and keeping, uh, keeping this event going. To all of you for turning up. Um, please do before you go, if you can just um, drop that um, action that you might take into the chat bar. 
Uh, and there will also be a feedback form. And it is through that feedback form that the Good Practice Exchange team is able to put on these events and keep these free events going. So please, please do offer your feedback. Um, thank you to everyone who has contributed today. Apologies to all of those who's um, perhaps I haven't been able to draw into the conversation. Um, and um, let's just keep the things moving forward together. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been wonderful to be with you today. Enjoy the rest of Tristie's week. <laughs>